Diane did her PhD with Crystal van Steen in Liège, and she'll tell us about the outcome of her work. The, the floor is yours, Diane. Thank you. Good morning, and yeah, thank you, Carson, for the presentation. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, this title may seem a bit specific, but with simpler words, it means that um, I am going to talk about learning from data, and I'll take the specific example of um, systems in biomedicine. When you are doing data science, there are some generic steps that you will apply in most cases. Um, and here I will uh, take a use case, uh, a question to show the importance of these steps and to show how we can deal with them. So the question that I'm going to take here is how could we uh, understand better the genetic architecture of complex diseases? Complex diseases are caused by the interaction between environmental, genetic, and lifestyle factors. And it's important to understand them because, well, understanding the problem is often the first step towards uh, solving it. So, for example, in uh, the medical context, it can be the first step to translating biological findings into real-life uh, improvements, such as drug recommendation or uh, tools for diagnosis. And in uh, any data science project, the, the heart of the project, the foundation, is the data. What data do we need? What data do we have? And how should we represent the data? And this last question is actually very important because the way you represent the data will have a direct impact on the model that you, you use and then on the result that you get. So it's not only important at the output level, it's also important at the input level. Um, in life science and actually in many domains such as computer science and sociology, we have more and more proofs that often elements are not independent, they are interconnected. Um, and a good way um, to, to see that is to see the elements as a system with interconnecting features. And this is where networks come in because networks is a good visualization of uh, connected features. Networks are a data structure with nodes and edges modeling the relations uh, between the nodes. There are different flavors of networks, different families of networks. For example, networks can be binary. Um, in that case, the nodes or, and, and the edges uh, will either be present or absent, but it can also be weighted networks um, where the edge weights can represent the strength of the association or the confidence we have in the association. Um, so graphs are not only useful to see a global visualization of the data, it also shows uh, the different uh, substructures. So you can zoom in and see important details about the substructures. In the meantime, we have more, uh, we have increasingly complex data, and this gives rise to heterogeneous networks. In other words, um, we have different points of view to look at the data. We also have a different methods to analyze the data, and this will give uh, differences in networks. This is what I call network heterogeneity and this complicates the replication and the interpretation of findings. And the last concept that I need to introduce uh, to reply to the main question, which was how could we understand the genetic architecture of complex diseases better, is the concept of uh, epistasis. Epistasis occur when the effect of a combination of genes is not due to their independent effects. So in uh, epistasis networks, the nodes will be genetic units of analysis, for example, genes, and there will be an edge between two nodes if there is an effect of the combination of the nodes on the phenotype. Um, epistasis detection is a quite complex problem, uh, spe yeah, especially because it's in, it involves a lot of statistical tests. So there are many methods developed for that, but they all give rise to uh, different epistasis networks. And today there is no real grip on what aspect of the methodology is uh, producing the differences and so similarity in the network or in the networks or dissimilarity in the networks. Okay, so now we have all the concept and this figure is summarizing the main steps we are proposing to, um, to solve the problem. So first we will see how detecting and understanding the sources of heterogeneity will help to see um, the, the differences we would like to reduce uh, in the networks. 
then we will specifically see the reduction of the heterogeneity between the networks. And finally, we will have a look at how we can uh, enhance the interpretability. So in this first project, we are interested in graph comparison. We would like to create groups of graphs. Um, in one group, the graphs are similar. Um, but there are several specificities in our context. First, we would like to derive an algorithm that is, as I said, specific for graphs. That means that the distance that we are going to use, for example, should be uh, derived for graph. Then we would like to do clustering, so unsupervised classification, um, because most of the time, very, of, yeah, very often, and especially in the biomedical context, um, we don't know the group label. For example, in disease subtyping, sometimes the group labels are not known. And actually, here, we don't even know the number of groups we would like to derive. So the algorithm will need to derive it itself. And finally, we would like to incorporate some notion of uh, significance in the algorithm, because we would like to make sure that if we say that two groups are different, then they are statistically significantly, significantly different. So we uh, developed the pipeline presented here that we called NetaNova. Starting from a list of networks, we compute the pairwise uh, distance between each uh, between, yeah, between the pairs of networks. Um, there are many existing uh, metrics for that. It will be um, dependent on the context. For example, in epistasis, we don't only want to compare the structure of the networks, but also the name of the nodes is important, the genes. Um, so we will need a, a distance that requires no node correspondence. Then we apply an unsupervised clustering algorithm to um, get some groups and to really uh, see where we should put the truncation point in the dendrogram, so how we could obtain the final groups, we apply a recursive algorithm. So we go from the top to the bottom of the dendrogram and we apply a customized uh, ANOVA test to see with, where, whether the within group variation is smaller than the between group variation. And we do that for the two first group. If this, the groups are statistically different, then we do it in each of the two subgroup and so on. Um, so we're kind of building a tree where there are two stop conditions. Either the groups uh, are not statistically different or the groups are too small. And to evaluate the model, the algorithm, we uh, did some simulations. We created an original network. We disturbed it to create group, group networks and then we disturbed them again to create individual networks. And the goal is um, from the individual networks to trace back to which group they belong. Uh, to do that, we evaluate the performance with the Jacquard index. So it ranges from zero to one and one is the best value. Uh, this is not shown here, but we evaluated the type one error and it's under control. That means that when we don't have any group, uh, then we don't detect any group, which is good. Uh, here is the, gra is the figure for the power. So when there are groups, do we detect the groups? Um, we can see that some uh, factors influence the results and some uh, not. For example, uh, the number of networks and uh, the density of the networks do, does not seem to have a big influence on the detection of the group. But um, for example, the number of groups or the multiple testing correction algorithm that we apply uh, will have an effect. And uh, regarding the multiple testing correction, it's um, the thing is that we need uh, a not too stringent multiple testing correction because the, the algorithm in itself is already a bit conservative. Okay, now we can detect group, groups of similar graphs so we can, uh, we can understand the sources of heterogeneity and now we would like to reduce this heterogeneity. So in uh, this project, I uh, will um, talk about the importance of choosing the variables wisely and um, cleaning the data, uh, yeah, the importance of cleaning the data. So here we started from two observations. Uh, first, we have a growing biological knowledge and there is a need to study the combination of this biological knowledge with epistasis to see if we can uh, get better results. And the second thing is that genes are often the natural units of analysis. Uh, in biology because they are easily interpretable, uh, more easily interpretable, and um, they can be linked, for example, to pathways, biological pathways. But in epistasis, the unit of analysis is very often um, the SNPs, so a smaller unit of analysis. So we would like to 
study uh, the impact of going from SNPs to genes. Uh, at the bottom of this slide, this is um, a simplified version of the workflow. We test the SNP, uh, the, the epistasis at the SNP level, and we define some function to map SNPs to genes. For example, it can simply based on physical distance, but we also tried um, mappings based on QTL information or chromatin information. Then we convert a SNP test into gene test uh, using the um, adaptive truncated product methodology to aggregate um, test results. So basically it, uh, it aggregates the p-value that are below some pre-specified threshold. Um, then we used biological knowledge to reduce the, reduce the search space. So we focus on gene interactions that are known. And importantly, it's not gene interactions that are known for the disease under investigation. Um, it's uh, gene interactions that are known in general for any biological process. Uh, and finally, um, we combine the analysis with the pathway uh, analysis to, to see the broader context in which epistasis may occur. So this is an extract of the results. We applied different vari variations of the paper I just presented to an IBD dataset, uh, which contains approximately 70,000 individuals. Half of them are uh, cases. They either have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, and half of them are controls. Um, what we see here is that when we apply different uh, mappings, so for example, here's uh, standardized physical mapping, uh, or uh, EQTL and chromatin, which is more related to functionality. And also for EQTL and chromatin, we filter for biological knowledge. So we only keep the gene interactions that are known to be interacting. Then we see that we get very different results. Uh, for example, on the left with the standard pipeline, we, uh, even though we test uh, a lot of uh, SNPs and a lot of genes, so the multiple cor testing correction um, is quite strong, but still this is a pipeline which gives rise to the bigger network. Uh, and for the two um, uh, networks on the right, um, yes, we have less um, interactions, but these interactions are more interpretable and they are more uh, robust and also they, they lead to relevant pathways. So we get to have different points of view when trying all these different pipelines. Uh, then another way to reduce the um, heterogeneity between networks is to aggregate the networks. So for example, if, you, if we use the first um, project I presented, we group graphs into um, groups of similar networks, and then we can apply an aggregation in each of these subgroups to get only one representative graph per, graph per group. It means that we are creating an aggregated graph, which will be, which is kind of a summary of the group. So it's also based on simulations. We created um, a network that we call the true network and some partial networks that only partially represent the true network. And the goal is from the partial networks, uh, from the edges of the partial networks to predict the value of the edges in the true network. So zero or one, uh, the edge is absent or is present. Um, we tried three models to, um, to see if it's possible. We tried k-means, uh, Latin class analysis, and similarity network fusion. And we evaluate the performance with the F1 score because uh, we have data imbalance. We have a lot more edges that are absent than edges that are present. Um, for example, we, we tried multiple settings. For example, in graph C, we increased the number of nodes in the partial networks. And in graph T, we increase the number of partial networks. And what we saw is that the Latin class analysis methods is performing is outperforming the other in all scenarios. So this is an example of a method that we could use uh, if we want to summarize multiple networks into only one to get a representative network that is easier to compare to other representative networks rather than comparing uh, many networks from many groups. Okay, so now that we have all the methods, um, let's solve the, the main uh, question we asked at the beginning. Um, let's gather them to see what we can do with them. Um, we have seen that um, when we apply different pipeline for epistasis detection, then we obtain uh, very different results. Um, 
So for example, here, when we, uh, we applied 10 different epistasy detection tools to the IBD dataset, the same as in the, the second project, um, and they already differ in the input they require. For example, some of them will require imputed data, or some of them will require, um, will only deal with binary phenotypes. Uh, and they also differ in their output. Uh, some of them will output um, statistics or uh, p-values, or some of them will just output the ranking of the, the SNP pairs. Um, so for each of these tools, we applied four different variants. Uh, either we corrected for population structure or not, and uh, either we uh, included some biological knowledge uh, or not. And here is um, an extract of the results at the SNP level, so no network information is used here. Um, what we've done is that we selected the top thousand pairs for each uh, workflow, for each analysis, and then we computed the number of pairs in common um, in each different uh, pairs of methods. And what we see is that um, epiblaster, linear regression, and boost are quite uh, are, are very similar to each other. And this is uh, this means that at the SNP level, the comparison is indicative of uh, the tool that we use. It's differentiating the tool that we use, and actually, it's differentiating differentiating between the modeling framework because uh, epiblaster, linear regression, and boost are all based on uh, statistics. Uh, on the right is um, a comparison at the SNP level as well, but based on the rank, and we see approximately the same thing, so I will not go into the details. And now we go from SNP to genes. Um, so for that, we do um, the same thing as in the second project. So we map the, the SNP to the gene using a, a, um, a MAC function. Here we used um, the QTL1. Uh, and we either post filter for biological knowledge or not. Uh, we applied the algorithm of the first project, so the one where we were building the groups of similar networks. And uh, here we see that we have a big purple uh, group. And in this group, we find all the methods where we used um, biology, so all the biologically driven methods. So that means that when we include biology in the methods, then um, we reduce the heterogeneity. And it's kind of intuitive because we target, we are uh, reducing the search space here. And uh, on the contrary, when we don't use any biology in the pipeline, we see that it gives rise to many different clusters. For example, all the analysis based on the neural network weights are in a different cluster and the one uh, with light GBM as well. And finally, we applied the, the network aggregation method that I showed in the search project uh, for uh, all the purple networks, so all the networks in the purple group. And what we have seen here is that um, it gives rise to this network, uh, where I couldn't write the gene names because there are too many. Um, but m many genes are related to uh, the HLA region, and the HLA, the HLA region is known to be very important in IBD. So this overlap with a uh, known biology of uh, IBD. Uh, the message of uh, this project uh, is multifold. Uh, first, it gives insight into um, the differences of the methods that results in differences in epistasis networks. Uh, also, it shows the importance of applying multiple epistasis methods uh, on the same data set because uh, we obtain different results, so we obtain different points of view of the disease. And also, it shows um, the importance of, um, of uh, including biological knowledge. So to summarize, um, I showed three different methods, and I gathered them in, um, to, to show their impact on a specific use case. The first thing that we can say is um, about the versatility of the methods, because here I used them for uh, networks. Um, which was my main uh, PhD topic, but actually most of the methods that, I, that we developed uh, are applicable to um, a lot of uh, types of data. Um, it also shows the important uh, steps that um, we, we always apply in any data science project. So choosing the data 
uh, and the variable wisely. Here it was focusing on genes instead of SNPs to get more interpretability. Also representing the data, the representation of the data is important. Here we decided to go with networks because we were looking at interactions. Um, then it's important to look at the sources of variation uh, between uh, the observation. Um, in this case, we did that by grouping um, similar observations together and by aggregating then this um, observation, these similar observations. And finally, it shows the importance of cleaning the data. Um, here, it was related to the way we filtered the edges in the networks um, while including biological information. So I would like to thank my collaborator and I also would like to uh, thank you for your attention and let me know if you have any question. Yeah, thank you for your questions from the audience. Maybe I start by asking, Dian, when you compare these different epistasis detection methods to each other, you introduce another level of multiple testing, not only in the space of SNP pairs or combinations, but also in the realm of methods. Have you thought about this and how this affects your results? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So we, um, since we, we compare the networks obtained with the different um, uh, tools or methods, we didn't correct for multiple testing here. Um, we are not doing any prediction, and um, yeah, the, we yeah we 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 didn't go uh, a level a level further uh, the the epistasis networks. We stopped there. So we, I mean, to my opinion, there was no, no. need to correct for multiple testing. Yeah. So, but have you looked at questions like whether the the consensus between these different methods, for example, has, has particular properties. So, so are the interactions, so you show, convincingly showed that the results differ in general, that you can detect differences. But have you also looked at the question whether the, the common uh, parts, the interaction between the different methods has any special... When we don't use any biological information, sometimes they don't overlap at all. So there is no That's intersection. Um, and that was uh, also one of the reasons we wanted to do this comparison, because sometimes there was no intersection, nothing in the intersection at all. But when we do inter in integrate biology, then there is um, indeed something in the intersection. And in that case, it could be um, yeah, the common uh, biological processes that is uh, probably the most relevant for the disease. And then um, things that are not in, uh, detected in most of the uh, epistasis networks, but only in one or the other, it's probably um, either uh, less important, I would say, it's probably not the, the correct biological word, but uh, yeah, uh, it's not, at least it's not, it doesn't seem uh, as essential as, as uh, the, the gene pairs, for example, that we find in most of the methods. Yeah. Thank you. Another question for Dian? I would have one more. When you, so these different methods do not necessarily compare exactly or search exactly the same space. So I'm making up an example. Some search pairs of SNPs, others search higher order combinations of SNPs. And then, so with three or more uh, SNPs. And then when the methods are, are parameter sensitive in, in the sense that you may choose like a significance threshold for each of these methods. But this may mean something different when you search a quadratically growing search space or a cubically growing search space and so on. So, so it's, I think it's very hard to find the, the best way how to compare these different approaches to each other such that the parameters mean exactly the same. Or, yes. uh, and, and, this, and the parameters have an, have an impact on the results that you obtain. So have you considered this yes. point, how to maximize the comparability between the different methods? Yeah. This is a, a very valid uh, concern. Um, so what we've done is that um, we didn't set the exact, the exact same uh, threshold for each method. First, because sometimes it was not possible, because as you said, sometimes it's just a ranking and sometimes it's a p-value, so we cannot deal with significance exactly the same way. Um, what we've done is that for uh, one tool, we 
uh, took the recommended way of uh, doing significance uh, assessments uh, in the paper where the, the tool was published. So um, it's true that it's different ways of looking at significance for each method, but since they are so different from each other, then there was no way to apply the same uh, threshold. And even if we were applying the same threshold, as you were saying, then it could compare different things because, well, the methods were differently, so they are not looking at the same uh, search space. So yeah. Could you look at something like a ranking of the edges that you, that you try to find one common way of representing the results and you, you rank all the edges in the network as ranked by the different methods? I mean, you're looking at subgraphs sometimes or yes. like, like combinations, but maybe, maybe the, the way to do it is to bring it down to the simplest form, mm -hmm. the simplest element or the simplest unit, edges, and then to get a ranking of edges for each method and to, to compare these rankings to. So you mean to each other? Of uh, course, you lose uh, you lose some parts of the interaction. Then yeah, again, so I, if you boil it down to to edges, so somewhere you will probably lose some yes, but information. If yeah. I understand correctly, it's, it's a bit similar to what we've done on the right here. Yeah. So we've ranked the the, the SNP pairs. Yes, yes. And then we compared the yeah. the ranking, but we needed to again set a threshold because some methods uh, output very few SNP pairs. Some method output a lot of snippet pairs, so we, we went for the, the minimum. Um, okay, okay, yeah. that's how you, yeah. how you made it comparable, good, thanks. Okay, so with this, we thank Diane for her presentations and her answers, thank you very much. <laughs>